I'm Ian Williams, president of the Foreign Press Association, and I'm speaking to Laura Merton Houghton, who uh, came from Tirana uh, to the University of North Carolina. Was it? No, it was not the University of North Carolina. He came from. It was the University of Maryland at the College Park. Right. So this was a huge um, expansion of the universe for Laura, obviously. Her father was a political exile. Her movements were constrained. Uh, leaving Albania was the edge of the event horizon for most Albanians at the time, since o o Enver Hoxha ran a very tight uh, ship, more like a galley with slaves in it, rowing hard. Um, he managed to alienate, just to remind those of you who don't from these days, Enver Hoxha first of all fell out with uh, Tito and started hostilities with Yugoslavia. Then he fell out with the Soviet Union and started hostilities with China. And then he fell out with China and pretty much started hostilities with everybody. Um, so it was a fairly constrained uh, intellectual and political atmosphere uh, in which uh, Enver Hoxha, who put his selected works in storage somewhere, uh, had, had theories about almost anything. But um, did your upbringing how did your upbringing get into cosmology? Was the Marxist, Leninist, Hojaist education system at all inclined towards cosmology? Or was it something that you picked up inadvertently? Uh, no, natural sciences were uh, probably the safest um, compartment in the Albanian society that was not infected by uh, politics. So uh, that, that, uh, that regime had very little to influence on, on math or physics and so on. The reason I ended up a uh, physicist and a uh, uh, cosmologist was uh, mainly because uh, early on I was inclined to natural sciences. I, I was naturally um, uh, good at math, physics, biology. I wasn't good at anything else, especially social sciences. So it, it just happened naturally. And my father was a mathematician and, and that although he, he never told me uh, what, what to do and uh, what topic to choose, but uh, just our conversations uh, every day must have uh, been inspiring and, and uh, drew me even deeper in, into how beautiful mathematics is. And of course, theoretical physics is very closely related to mathematics. So I, I knew early on that uh, I would be um, studying science in, in Albania and I, from what I've seen and known since uh, uh, since the Berlin Wall that changed that part of the war of the world, uh, the whole Eastern Europe, in Albania and, and in all the, the Eastern European countries, education was was a, a very important component of the society, uh, and and the reason was uh, straightforward. If you think of uh, communism, trying to advertise that everybody is equal. Um, independent of their skill, merit, capacity, work, and so on. So you're trying to fit everybody in, into a shoebox. And then that goes against human nature. It's, uh, we are different. And, and that's the beauty of, of the human species, that we have different talents, we, we have different interests, we, we are good at certain things and not good at other things. So in, in a uh, society as crushing as, as a dictatorship, it becomes even more important. It is it's a driving factor to, to every human to try and find ways to distinguish themselves, to differentiate themselves from, from being the same, from, from the sameness that uh, the society imposes on you. And, and uh, that's why education was, was really the only available tool for, for uh, people in, in Albania and, and I'm sure in, in other uh, communist countries at that time, education was the way to, to try and raise yourself above that level of uh, mediocrity. So education was a, a very important in Albania. Social sciences were heavily influenced by politics. Of course, that, that's where you put air and where you had to embrace the party line of uh, Albania being the best country in the world and being the center of the cosmos and how all the other countries suffered so much and were exploited so much that there was no point on, on 
being interested in them, that that was uh, uh, the propaganda that uh, the Communist Party and Hoja were selling at the time. Of course, nobody believed that because um, whenever you, you try to, to impose your will upon people, then people react against it. Uh, however, if, if, uh, if certain people uh, work, I don't know, in political sciences, in, in law, um, in history, which was a bunch of guys in, in, uh, in Albanian times, then, then of course you, you couldn't uh, move too far out of that party line because uh, then you'd get yourself in trouble and in jail. There was a certain freedom in natural sciences. So in, in that sense, the, the Department of uh, Natural Sciences, Physics, Biology, Chemistry and Mathematics were, were very strong in, even in Albania. Well, you know, you're, you've become one of the world's uh, most innovative and um, prominent cosmologists uh, with your recent work, which we'll get back to soon. But uh, people might forget that Albania was the first official atheist state in the world. All yeah. the churches and mosques and presumably the synagogues and chapels were closed down. So did this influence the, the cosmology that they taught, a, a, a sort of creator-free cosmology, or was that ancillary to your studies? I didn't learn cosmology in Albania. Albania at the time when I was growing up didn't have a graduate school in, in uh, physics, so I couldn't uh, move to more advanced studies. We are only at the undergraduate uh, level at the Faculty of Physics. Uh, so in that sense, no. Uh, the fact that Albania was an atheist country did not uh, influence me. I, I, I did all my advanced studies in the US. I've spent more time in the US than, than I spent in Albania. But uh, the, the religion part in, in the Albanian society is uh, quite an interesting component. So perhaps at, at some level, uh, inside me, the, there is some influence like, like uh, in all the people that were born in Albania. And I say that because, yes, when uh, I was born and I grew up and the whole generation of Albanians then and then that are still living now, they, they were born and grew up in, in a uh, completely, strictly atheist society. So my knowledge of any religion is, is uh, very ignorant, in fact, and, and, and that's a gap in my education. But um, um, even before then, uh, before, when, before communism took over, when Albania was under the Ottoman Empire, was invaded by, by uh, the Ottoman Empire, and, and before then, it was under the Roman Empire, and before then, it was under the ancient Greek Empire. So always, religion and, and it's a very uh, old nation. It's um, uh, pre-Greek and pre-Roman and it used to be bacon in those days. So any kind of religion that uh, moved to Albania at some point in history was always associated with an invasion. And, and uh, in, in that sense, although Albanians are probably the most tolerant uh, people religion-wise that, that I've come across in any country in the world, they they are open and welcome and, and embrace all, all kinds of religions, but none, not, not a single religion really stuck deeply in Albania because of, of that association that it was always foreign thought. It, it came to the country along with, with boots on the ground. Yes, I remember a trip to Tirana after the fall where I saw somebody with a green turban and robe and discovered he was a Bekdashi monk. And I thought he was my type of Muslim monk because he had a glass of whiskey, he was smoking a cigarette and he was talking to an attractive young lady at the same time. So I thought, if, if this is fundamentalism, I can live with it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh, I, I got the Episcopalian nature of um, <laughs> Albanian yeah. Islam at the time. Yes, uh, and then, then the bottle of grappa in, in front of a mosque or a church, yeah. <laughs> But uh, so Robert Papa wants to know, do, do you think the Albanian education system helped you to be at this level? I mean, was there a special concentration on the natural sciences and an encouragement of it that got you this far? As I said, uh, when we started, uh, that was one of the components, but uh, there are so many factors. I mean, I, I 
the, a key component is the fact that I got so lucky to, to have the Fulbright scholarship and, and move to the states where I could access the, the higher education. Um, having a strong background at, at the undergraduate level from the Faculty of Sciences in Tirana certainly helped. But otherwise, I'd not have reached the point of moving to the graduate level. Uh, having the, the father that I had, uh, who was uh, so encouraging without being pushy, and uh, who introduced me from when I can remember from three years old onwards uh, to, to the beauty of. Uh, of these big questions about nature, science, mathematics, and the, the beauty he, he saw and found in the equations that he shared with me, and then the beauty of uh, going for a stroll together in, in the evening and then looking up at, at the night sky and then just finding the, the whole universe and, and uh, any question, any deep question about the cosmos so inspiring. That, that was something that I shared with him and then uh, that uh, only encouraged me further. So it's not one unique component, whether it was the education I got in the Faculty of uh, Natural Sciences in Tirana or, or uh, the graduate school at uh, the University of Maryland, and then uh, later on uh, working with uh, Leonard Parker for my PhD. And uh, he's a world authority in quantum field theory in first space time. So there, there is a... Uh, a blend of, of many factors that uh, led me to where I am today. Well, this brings us to your book, because one of the things you managed to interweave, uh, I think, uh, very successfully and make it much more readable, is the, the hard theory of the history of the universe from before the Big Bang to after the Big Whimper or whatever, to uh, uh, interweaving it with your personal life. And your father comes across as somebody, he, he wasn't, my father, if he spoke to us at all, addressed us as though we were a public meeting. But yours was seemed to be more concerned about providing a nurturing educational environment and, 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 and encouraging and um, uh, helping you look further. Uh, he's obviously played a large part in your life, but this is where you may as well come up with the book. Yes. This is Laura's book, which I read very shortly. I mean, I've got to compliment you. This is a book by a mathematical physicist about the nature of the universe. And you achieve the equivalent of uh, an Italian making a speech while sitting on their hands. Because you introduced almost no mathematical formula in there. <laughs> I was like, it, it, the, the math is there, but it's described. It's, it's not shown off. And for most lay people, uh, you know, even, um, interested lay people like myself, there's nothing more off-putting than a, a, a page or a line of equations and mathematical formulae. Uh, your formulae are sort of pretty much on the comprehensible equals MC squared style, which even I can remember. I've forgotten how to factor a quadratic equation, but I could probably remember if I tried, but E equals MC squared, I can manage, and you did this. So, I mean, the key part of the book and what's uh, got your reputation was your discovery that there are ways to know what happened before the Big Bang. And perhaps you could explain to people why it is that until then, nobody thought we could find out what happened be before the Big Bang. Just as before um, Stephen Hawkins came, uh, we had no clue what was happening inside a black hole. Uh, but there are tangential clues, which he discovered on black holes and you discovered on the Big Bang. Can you explain this? Uh, yes, certainly. So uh, until uh, uh, recently, the, the uh, law in the field was that uh, we have this universe, only one universe that uh, started uh, as a very small patch uh, full of energy and it blew up pretty quickly into, into the large universe that uh, we see today. When I say pretty quickly, I'm, I'm talking uh, as a cosmologist. So pretty quickly for me is 14 billion years. Um, but um, in, in, in that sense, the, the whole description of what we see around us, the structure formation, all the galaxies and the stars and the planets, uh, the, the light, the radiation in, in the fabric of uh, space-time known as the uh, cosmic microwave background, which is a leftover of that early moment when, when our universe blew up. Uh, all of those seem to fit perfectly well with, with this uh, beautiful, 
picture of uh, cosmic inflation. Uh, as as uh, science moves forward, we collect more data and all the data also seems to agree with, with that uh, view of starting with this universe, very small, not long ago that blew up and, and uh, uh, the quantum fluctuations of, of that early energy are the ones that later on condense and create all the structures that we see. That fits beautifully well. And then you may wonder what then what's the problem? If, if, if we have a theory and we have the data that backs it up, then we should be happy, we are done. But we're not done. And, and that's where uh, one of the giants of physics, Sir Roger Penrose, uh, estimated and pointed out uh, in the 70s. He estimated that the chance to start the universe like that one, where you have a small, smooth patch, like extremely small, uh, full of energy that blows up and creates the universe, that chance is nearly zero. He estimated it's one chance in 10 to the power 10 to the power 123. And uh, Roger and I have debate, uh, debated this uh, issue quite a bit over the last decade or, or so. And in the last de uh, debate we had four years ago, he corrected me, he said, if you look at uh, dark matter, it will be to the power 124, not 123, which of course doesn't make a difference. It's still zero. And, and, and that, that's the ill famous problem of the origin of the universe. How can such a simple picture that explains so much of what we see around us, be so unnatural, have a zero chance to come into existence spontaneously. And then the community was divided since the, uh, since the 70s in two groups. There was the group of naysayers that said, no, we've, we've really not got a problem. That's nothing to worry about. We'll never know what was there before the Big Bang or if there is such a thing as, as before the Big Bang. Perhaps we started with the singularity, like you, what you have in the center of a black hole. So there is nothing we can do about it. All our physics theories break down there, so we can't go further. And then there was another group, the curious ones, that were like, hold on a minute, we, we can't put a curtain of prohibition there and say, this is it. We won't ask questions any further. That, that just goes against the, the nature of the scientists. We, we don't want to be limited in, in our questions. And then, when, when I moved in the US uh, and, and started uh, learning more about uh, these questions and, and all the theories that go behind it in my uh, graduate studies, I, I was naturally inclined towards this second group of, of people that don't like to be prohibited and, and like to continue drilling down on, on, onto this question. So I, I was fascinated by, by uh, what uh, what gave this extremely unlikely universe and what was there before and how did the whole, all the bits fit together into a coherent picture. I, uh, when uh, I got my uh, faculty job in 2004 at uh, the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, where I'm still as a professor there even now, um, I thought, okay, now I can afford to spend more time in, with this question. And uh, I, I started thinking, how can I even ask, why did we start with this universe? If all I allow myself with is one universe, it doesn't make sense. If you have only one object in your pocket, it's meaningless to say, what is the chance that if I put my hand in my pocket, I'll pull out that object? Of, of course, it's 100%. It is the only object in your pocket. You know, a tempted to go full Southern Baptist, and there was a guy around who said, let there be light, and lo, there was light. <laughs> <laughs> I have nothing to say about that part of the story. <laughs> okay. But, uh, <laughs> um, so I, from a uh, scientist, scientist uh, point of view, I wanted to be able to calculate the answer and derive the answer, whatever the, the result was, even if... Uh, the result was the same as what Roger had found in the 70s. So that way of thinking led me to um, figure out that the only way I can calculate and ask that question meaningfully is if I start with a pool of possible universes, infant universes, from which then I can ask, what is the chance to start with this one ra rather than something else? I got lucky there because uh, that was the year when uh, string theories ended up deriving from string theory, which is the 
underlying theory and the candidate of uh, quantum gravity, but they, they had ended up uh, finding out a pool of many possible potential big banks that uh, they coined the landscape of string theory. So all the pieces that I needed were there. I was prepared to address my question of the origin of our universe within a pool of possible big banks. And there was string theory providing exactly that pool that I needed. Then um, I had the idea that uh, in order to calculate, since the universe was very small at its infancy, I could calculate using quantum equations. That, that was the connection that I made between the Could two you fields. hazard a moment and explain to people, uh, remember I was, when I was a child, the Big Bang itself was a bit of a new trade theory. <laughs> The, yeah. the people advocating steady state, apart from creationism. So uh, string theory was, uh, you know, 20 years ago, it was still sort of um, not quite pseudoscience, but it was on the it was on the event horizon for science. So w w is it well accepted now? And what is it if it is? Well, the, the modern version of the Big Bang is cosmic inflation. And uh, the, the two founding fathers are Alan Good and uh, Andre Linde. And absolutely, it, it is the, accepted as a standard model of cosmology, because as I mentioned before, all the observations we have so far of the sky, all of them agree exquisitely well with that picture. And then remember that when, when we look uh, far away in the sky with a telescope at, at a distant uh, star, we're looking back in time because it took time for the light of that star to reach us here on Earth. And therefore, whatever we are seeing today from that light was what happened to that star that gave that light, say, four billion years ago or five billion years ago. So the, the further we see in the distance, the, the more we are looking back in time. And therefore, there is no doubt of what has happened to our universe over time because we can actually see that with uh, telescopes. We can't go, of course, we, we cannot see anything at the moment of creation. In fact, we can't see much on, on uh, the, the first- Well, but we're back to fairly close with the latest telescope, aren't we? Yeah, yeah exactly, so. 13.8 yeah, no... billion, I think, yeah. it was, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. There, there, there is very little doubt on, on the standard model of cosmology being correct for what it explains from, the moment that the universe starts growing to present day. But it is still an incomplete theory because it is based on that assumption of having a tiny patch of uh, space full of high energies, and then that is put by hand. So the question is, what gave that? Well, your breakthrough was to see tangible evidence. And we're talking about hypotheses that are proven or disproven by observations and facts, aren't we? So looking at the cosmic atlas, you discover the aberrations that uh, could be explained by your theory of quantum entanglement before the Big Bang. Am I summarizing that properly? Uh, yes, we, we predicted that, and uh, that's the work <coughs> that I did with uh, two collaborators, Tomo Takahashi and uh, Rich Holman. Uh, we predicted, so as I was describing before, I had that idea of using quantum equations to actually calculate the chance that our universe came out of that landscape of energies. And uh, therefore, I, I was able to extend to complete that picture of uh, cosmic inflation to from before the Big Bang when we were just a, when the whole universe was just a wave packet sitting on some energies in, in that landscape to through the Big Bang when it explodes and then it continues growing to, to now. Um, that doesn't happen to only to our universe. There is a whole family in, in quantum mechanics. You always have a family of solutions that uh, you find all the branches of the wave function. So there are many universes, many wave packets that go through a similar story to ours and then go through their respective big banks and then uh, produce their classically large universes. Somehow these universes have to decouple from each other when they are branches of the wave function, they are all quantum entangled to each other. So as they go through their- This is when we move from quantum 
Exactly. To, to, to the Big Bang to, to growing large. Newtonian, Einsteinian. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So once you grow large, then you are classical. The, the quantum nature is, is wiped out. But, but early on, we know we are quantum. So the universe is a wave packet, but so are all the other universes. And they are quantum entangled to each other. As they go through respective banks, they also have to start decoupling from each other. And that's uh, done through something that uh, is known as decoherence in physics. But this process, this decoupling, this decoherence, is uh, this wiping out, this washing out of quantum entanglement is done at the same time as, as the universe is going through a cosmic inflation, and therefore it leaves its traces, its uh, dense scars, the quantum fluctuations of that Big Bang, the, the, the exact same quantum fluctuations that later on produce structure and light in the universe. And, and since we had a uh, complete story from before to through the Big Bang to after the Big Bang, we could follow the story of, of how quantum entanglement left its scar at, at the moment of decoupling and what that scar would look like today. We just fast forward this, everything, the whole story to present day. So we were able to make predictions for what those scars should look in our sky today. And, and that was done in 2005 and uh, early 2006. One of the yeah. predictions that uh, we ended up calculating, and in our case, everything was calculated. It, it wasn't guessed or hypothesized. But um, what we predicted was a very large area of, in the sky of about 10 degrees uh, that should be completely empty of structure, of uh, galaxies, stars, and so on. That breaks one of the cherished uh, predictions of cosmic inflation, uniformity. In cosmic inflation, everything blows up uniformly like a balloon. So you expect a very uniform distribution of stars and galaxies throughout the, the sky. Much so, energy, in fact. Yeah. So predicting that there is an area of, of the sky, which is quite large, it's 10 degrees angle, uh, that is empty. We call that the giant void. That, that was uh, uh, really a risky prediction at the time because it, it threatened the, the uniformity. So you predicted it and then it was found, which must be a wonderful feeling. Yes, uh, like was, Newton knew yeah. that apples fell from the tree. He didn't <laughs> he didn't have his theory and then say, oh look. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And that, that was uh, it, it was wonderful, also very shocking because uh, we were pretty convinced that the, the kind of uh, scars of signatures that we predicted in our sky would uh, rule out the, the theory that we had come up with. So uh, having them uh, seen first by the WMAP experiment, satellite experiment, uh, which is US based. And then later on, uh, that WMAP was replaced by the European Planck satellite experiment that had more refined data. And Planck satellite actually confirmed all those uh, predictions that uh, we had made in 2005. And that was in 2018 when, when uh, they confirmed the existence of this giant void which shows as a cold spot in temperature maps of the sky. Because of course, if you don't have a concentration of stuff, of matter, then it's a very cold area of the sky. So the cold spot is, is confirmed now at exactly the size of uh, 10 degrees and the scale, the, the distance that uh, we had estimated long ago. And then that gave us hope because uh, one, one of the uh, uh, prejudice against the whole study of the multiverse was the fact that even if there is such a thing as, as uh, a multiverse out there, we will never be able to break out, break free of, of the horizon of our universe and go and see what lies beyond. And like me, in, and, and that's the, the parallel that I use in the book, in Albania, we were closed inside the Albanian borders at that time in, in the communist era, and uh, almost nobody could break free and see what, what what is just on the other side of the Atlantic, very close in Italy or, or, or in Greece. And um, now I was uh, finding this situation where the whole universe is concerned, where we have this beautiful universe, we can explain what we see inside, but we are forbidden to see what's outside it because of the horizon of, of the universe, the speed of light, we, we couldn't go further than that. However, with, with our work, the, the uh, one of the exciting findings was that 
when you calculate and then you have a, a complete theory, you don't know whether the theory is right or wrong. You make a set of predictions for what scars of that multiverse should look like inside in your sky. And then 10 or 15 years later, all those predictions are seen and confirmed. That of course is very reassuring because it shows that although we can't travel outside the borders of our universe, we can still find traces of the multiverse right here. So we, we, don't, we don't need to go to a, to a time before the Big Bang or, or to, to break free of, of the boundaries of our universe. And just to emphasize how cutting edge this is, uh, we have to remember Albert Einstein himself referred to quantum entanglement as spooky action at a distance. And yeah gave wonderful sayings like God does not play dice on the on the randomness of, uh, of, of quantum events. Uh, so we, we've come a long way since then. <laughs> Where, you know, um, you're, you're now sort of, you seem to have demonstrated satisfactorily, of course, waiting for somebody to disprove it, that we've got sort of echoes of before the big bang of the, of the quantum wave function and the events. Now, you're referring to the multiverse here. Our vocabulary fails us a bit. You, you mentioned our perception of things. I mean, many of us are still trapped with the perception that an atom is like a solar system with a proton like the sun in the middle and electrons whizzing around like planets around it when it's, and it sort of in, inhibits our thinking <laughs> about uh, the, the bigger things in the universe. And the idea of a wave and a particle being simultaneous, uh, the same thing. Uh, you know, I've good luck to Schrodinger's cat. I don't like cats very much. I've often wished it ill. <laughs> but, um, <coughs> uh, that's a separate story. <laughs> um, so, you know, the, the, all, all of this is now pretty much accepted because it's been demonstrated, uh, isn't it? So how do we describe we think of the universe, the cosmos, as everything that exists. So we don't even have the vocabulary. You know, you're talking about the multiverse. You're saying there's lots of universes. Um, or, or this is what's being hypothesized. And you seem to produce some evidence that right from the beginning. I mean, where is all of this? You know, uh, yeah. can, can our minds take this in? Is there another word for, you know, an ultra cosmos? That encompasses everything that we're thinking and talking about. Or... That's the multiverse, yeah. But uh, was it Mark Twain that uh, said, the, "The older I get, I get uh, the smarter my father becomes." <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, if you think about that, it's uh, yeah, it, it might be mind-boggling when when you think of the whole picture. Uh, it depends who you ask. If you ask me, I think it's. Uh, uh, it, it makes the cosmos more in, more uh, intricate and vastly more beautiful because it, it's more interesting. There is more stuff there. But if you think about it, um, it was only in the 1500s when when uh, Copernicus uh, came up with the Copernican principle. So back then we we found it mind-boggling that uh, the Earth is not the center of the solar system, and then then we we. Uh, shifted that the galaxy, the Milky Way, is not the center of the universe. And now this is really just an extension of saying that our universe is not at the center of the cosmos, but we're just a humble member in its vastness. There is a vast, beautiful, interesting cosmos full of universes like ours out there, and uh, we just occupy a humble corner in, in that uh, cosmos. I, I share your enthusiasm. I've been a lifelong science fiction fan, and I've had to reconcile myself to the fact that we're not going to go to the stars soon, uh, based on current <laughs> physics. <laughs> and uh, much as I like uh, Captain Kirk and his colleagues, <laughs> we ain't going to be sailing with them anytime soon. But you, yeah. you still have to, um, I mean, you sit back and you think of the scale of things between the microverse and the macroverse, the size of it. and I mean, don't you feel sometimes like you're a sort of a, a cell in pond scum trying to make sense of the world and the universe? Because the, the scale, when you look at the recent uh, satellite uh, pictures of the cosmos, the scale of it, the number of stars involved, 
it's just so it's just so mind boggling. It's it's the it's it's difficult not to be held back by uh you know your 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 humbleness as you I think the word you used mm -hmm. the, by the humility of who the hell are we? Why are we bothering? You know, but the, let, let's yeah. just lie back on the pond and scum along like the pond scum. <laughs> yeah. Well, absolutely. I mean, uh, um, everybody that uh, has children, you you watch them show such surprise at their surroundings as, as they are growing, they are discovering all the objects, things that we take for granted. And, and there is beauty in that. I mean, that, that's the attraction of, of the innocence of that age. And if you just increase that scale by a little bit, in, in uh, that sense, we are all children to, to the cosmos. And uh, when it comes to the big questions, I may know a few more equations than, than you do, because that's what I do for a living, is, is use those equations in my work. But really, when it comes to the big questions, apart from, from a very limited set of, of, uh, of tools that, that I may have compared to my neighbor next door, all of us are, are ignorant in, in, uh, in understanding what is out there, and, but all of us share that curiosity, that childlike curiosity. So we are all children in, in that sense in, when it comes to, to understanding the universe at the larger scales and the uh, uh, cosmos and the global nature of space and time. I mean, we haven't even gotten into the question of time, which is fascinating by itself. But uh, yeah, so um, I, I don't think of that in, in uh, of, of that curiosity in negative terms. I, I think it is one of the um, things that makes us humble as a species, less arrogant as a species. The fact that uh, we know something, but, but it's not a whole lot. And, and uh, also it, it makes us find common grounds to share that excitement of discovery and, and that uh, curiosity that, that uh, we all have about nature around us. You, you, you discovered when you came here, and it must have been reminiscent of um, the University of Tirana and Enver Hoxha, that uh, the scientific community has strong prejudices against people who rock the boat. Um, and uh, you know, the idea you, you, you were you came into a field and adopted a, at the, what at the time was a fairly unpopular and not well proven set of assumptions. And uh, I think you mentioned that you you know you had advice to steer away from this if you wanted to make a career on it. You know, it was yeah. a bit like uh, advice to a budding chemist: uh, no, no, phlogiston is not a good field to research. <laughs> Yeah. So maybe uh, you should try something else. So, I mean, how deep was that prejudice? Because we often find it that uh, we think of scientists as being rational, objective, but quite often they, they can be fairly petty and um, stick to their theories. And you seem to have um, got the thin end of that on several occasions. Yes, that's, that's correct. I mean, and, and uh, it's for various reasons. Some of it is prejudice. Uh, against a, a set of uh, orthodox beliefs in the field. Uh, some of it is uh, perhaps religious. Uh, when, when uh, I mean, there, there is nothing related to religion one way or another in, in uh, the work I do, but uh, uh, some, some people, short-sighted people, might uh, see religious connotations to, to the interpretation of the results which always surprises me, but uh, so there, there are various reasons. And uh, yes, academia is not uh, uh, safe from all the uh, petty emotions that go with uh, human nature. But that's, um, that, that's where my, uh, the, the wisdom I, I learned from my father and, and the kind of uh, survival tools that uh, he shared with me come really handy. So in, in whatever I've done until now, and then perhaps th this uh, puts me in a privileged positions, position because whatever I've done until now, I've just done it for the love of the subject, not because of some reward at the end of the line, not because I had any hopes of, of uh, rocking the boat or making some big breakthrough. It was just that I love doing what I do. And then uh, I, I 
am lucky enough to have that kind of joy every day of, of my uh, uh, working life. And uh, what I learned from my father is exactly take joy. Don't do something unless you don't love to do it. And, and the other part was all the resistance and the drama that might go with it, just ignore it as background noise. Then, then it's not as dramatic and, and tragic as, as it seems to be. So far it has worked. It doesn't mean it will work in the future. <laughs> I think I think it was in your book. It might be something else I read recently that it was mentioned that uh, Newton, one of the pretty much undisputed giants of the era in terms of uh, scientific breakthroughs, was apart from being an alchemist, mm -hmm. was actually so petty-minded that he basically made his predecessor Robert Hooke, another no mean physicist, a complete mm -hmm. non-person, did yeah. removed all trace of him from the Royal Society. Yeah. <laughs> Be, uh, uh, presumably petty jealousy grounds. So, you know, yeah. when, when we see the shoulders of giants, we often say a chip on them. Yeah, it's uh, funny you mentioned Newton. I, I just came back from the from Cambridge and uh, I uh, uh, visited, I, I saw his uh, death mask at, at the university there, at the, the Isaac Newton Institute of Astronomy. They, they have Newton's death mask and it is quite spooky. It's, it's it's, it's a uh, interesting experience. And, and then I arrived here and, and uh, I uh, um, find in, in, uh, in my office uh, a big envelope and somebody who had read my book and typed it had sent me the handwritten notes by uh, Dirac, another giant of physics. So there, there is a wonderful feeling. In, in Newton's case, I, I, I don't know, uh, the word has it that they may have found he didn't really burn all of Robert Hooke's uh, portraits and, and hadn't written out. They may have resurfaced. So yes, the Newton was was, uh, was known to, to be not so nice. But uh, putting that part, of, um, being a physicist doesn't mean that, that you are a good person. Albert Einstein didn't wear socks, but we forgive him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But uh, focusing on, on their genius, on, on uh, the legacy that uh, they left behind for us, it is beautiful. It's, you, you, you do feel uh, walking, uh, looking at, at, at their writings and, and what they discovered and walking the streets that they walk, you, you do feel that uh, influence that you're walking on the steps of uh, those giants. And it's a well, wonderful feeling. If I, if I were a commissar in the physics department at Girana University, the question I might ask, and I'm quite likely the senator for um, North Carolina might say to, this is all very well. What can we do with it? How will it make huh. money? What's the practical use? And I was thinking, you know, as we've just discussed, uh, 20 years ago, quantum physics and entanglement was spooky action at a distance. Lots of people are agnostic about it. And now they're building computers based on it. Yes, uh, and uh, of, uh, communication system. So, okay, you, you have managed to identify that there were contingent, touching, tangent, uh, tangential universes before the Big Bang. Can we call them? <laughs> well, um, you can't have applied science without basic research. So, without <laughs> fundamental physics, you can't have applied physics. That, that's number one. It's, uh, when, when uh, I am looking at a problem and, and uh, I'm trying to solve that problem, I'm not thinking, how can I apply that to industry? However, I am absolutely certain that any discovery made in physics pretty soon will find this application in industry. Look at uh, the web telescope. Some of the techniques that uh, were um, invented for, for the mirror, for the folding of the mirror, are already being used, applied in eye surgery. And then I give, um, or, or uh, Einstein's theory. When Einstein was uh, uh, discovering his theory of, uh, of uh, gravity, he wasn't thinking of GPS. Yet we are so rely on that GPS. We all use it when, when driving. And then it's based on uh, Einstein's theory. Uh, I give the example in the book of uh, Faraday. And in fact, I, I just uh, came back uh, I gave a talk. That's at, Michael uh, Faraday, the British physicist. Yes, I, I, I gave a talk two weeks ago at, at the Royal Institution, which is Faraday's old lab. 
And uh, in fact, Faraday started this tradition of uh, talks there. And uh, I, I give the example of Faraday's, uh, which is a true story in, in the book, in my book, uh, where uh, the minister, the equivalent minister of finance, the uh, minister of uh, exchequer in, in, in Britain, went and visited Faraday's lab in, in that same place where I, I was giving a talk two weeks ago. And uh, Oh, you and mean the said, chancellor of the exchequer? Yes, that's the one. Is the money man. <laughs> yes, and then he asked uh, Faraday the exact same question as you just asked. He said, all, all of this is so impressive, but what is this good for? And then, of course, Faraday was one of the co-founders of electricity and, and uh, a key figure along with Maxwell in unifying electricity and magnetism. So uh, Faraday looked at him and he said, uh, I don't know, sir, but I'm sure you'll tax it one day. <laughs> And then but, indeed yeah. we do pay for electricity. Yeah. In yeah. fact, Faraday in the north of England, where I was from, was famous not so much for his uh, physics. We now use Faraday cages to insulate people from electromagnetic waves. But he, his, the Faraday lamp was the one that allowed miners to go into coal mines without blowing themselves up <laughs> because it insulated the flame yeah. from the methane gas. Yeah. So, yeah. Other, you know, Faraday spanned both ends of the cosmos with this yeah. one. <laughs> he was uh, memorable and pr practical at the same time. Yeah. But uh, you, 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 you haven't got the funding to build any type of large Hadron Collider in UNC <laughs> or anything like that? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, we, we, we've got, uh, I can't remember, Amazon or Google or one of those uh, big companies moving, I think, yeah. Is safer than building a large hadron collider in Chapel. <laughs> you think <laughs> you could probably order one on Amazon. Whether they deliver it in yeah. time is another story. You can order anything else. Um, so I suppose we may as well get back to parochial stuff. Have your has your work been translated into Albanian, either dialect, Gag or Tusk? I don't know. But uh, equations are the, look the same in Albanian or in English. So I'm sure that uh, interested students can uh, can read them. And uh, Albania is, is a small country, and it shares many characteristics of small countries, say I don't know, uh, other small nations. Uh, Albania, as a result of, of having a unique language, a very old language, and then being small. Uh, Albanians, most Albanians speak English, Italian, some speak Greek, uh, some speak Russian, so it's, uh, it's very well versed in foreign languages. Uh -huh. But a lot of works get translated into Albanian though, don't they? Uh, is, is this going to be translated? I don't know, it's not up to me. It's uh, uh, Albanian publishing companies that uh, will have to contact Harper Collins. The, the US publisher of the book. I, I know that uh, it, it's uh, translated in Greek. There was a, uh, one, one of the, the uh, big uh, publishing companies in Greece, uh, got it from Harper Collins, but the uh, copyrights and uh, for, for the Greek language translation and, and is being translated in many other languages as well in, in Netherlands and in Romania and in Poland and all over. Yeah. I don't know about Albania. They haven't mentioned that yet. The Harper Collins. <laughs> well, it's uh, no. I have to say, I read it and and I read it quickly, straight through. It was uh, I am by no means a mathematician or a physicist. It was a good read, and especially I admired your facility in writing about a subject like this without battering us over the head with raw mathematics, um, which I think is a rare skill, and the way you interwove the personal and the political and the cosmological. So I, I really recommend people to go out there, buy it, read it and digest. And um, the bit we never touched is we, we discussed what might have happened before. Okay, your final, because we're closing. What happens at the end of the universe? Huh, nobody knows because uh, it will be dominated by the same type of energy as the one that uh, created the universe. and. Uh, since we don't still understand what that type of energy is that grows with the volume of the universe, then uh, 
Uh, it can end either in a big crunch or in a big leap where the very fabric of space time gets ripped apart. Uh, the big crunch would be where the whole universe crunches into a black hole, or quite likely it may end up in a uh, cosmic heat death, a large universe that is completely empty, but it grows so large that uh, it's empty and there are no structures allowed to be created in that universe. All, all the existing structures are, are diluted and far flung. So that's the most boring and dreadful scenario. But that's the one that uh, goes back to. Einstein's cosmological constant. It's uh, if dark energy that, that rules that end of the universe is the type of a vacuum, pure vacuum energy, the, the one that uh, Einstein called the biggest blunder of his life, then we're all going to end up in a cosmic heat death where the, the whole structure is wiped out and, and the universe is empty, cold, and dreadful for eternity. That's, I think that's the Hebrew version of hell. Sure, <laughs> <Hold it empty. laughs> but look, thank you very much, Laura. It's been uh, thank you illuminating once again. I really enjoyed the book, and um, uh, it's you know, um, Albania continues to surprise and introduce people like yourself to the world. It's uh, <laughs> thank you. It, it's a country that's uh, how should say, punches above its weight. <laughs> thank you. In the world. And, and I heard I haven't been back there for quite a while, but uh, I heard it's absolutely beautiful there now. Oh, it is. It's a beautiful country. I was yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I was working on a project there to encourage tourism, but yeah. uh, some of my ideas were a little um, too much for them. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I won't put them on here. I'll get lynched. <laughs> okay. Thank but you. thank you very much indeed. And uh, let us know about your future work and when when you discover uh, the timing of the heat death of the universe give us time to get out and switch universes <laughs> <laughs> bye thank, thank you. you very much thank you uh, everybody else uh, do follow we have future briefings coming up next week uh the newspaper access swaying the public towards hitler's line uh newspaper proprietors have been consistent the ones in 1939 were every bit as pernicious and evil as some of our major proprietors now. And you might notice the date, Thursday, September the 1st, was the start of World War II, at least from the British and French point of view. That's when they declared war on Germany. So it seems to be timely as we're sort of hovering around World War III at the moment as well. So please register, join the Foreign Press Association, get the details and Come soon. We'll see you. Thank you very much. Bye.